Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. On behalf of the Freedom from Slavery Forum, I want to welcome you and to thank everyone for joining us this morning here in America. I am Bukeni Waruzi, Executive Director of Free the Slaves. This is day four. Our focus today is on resources mobilization. And this is a big question. What is our movement's financial future? As we go along today, if you have any questions for our speakers, please put them in the Q&A thread. We will call on you. We also encourage you to share your thoughts in the chat. Please send them to all the participants as well, and not just the panelists. Please take a moment now to enter in the chat uh, your name and, the, and your organization and where you are located so we can use, so we can all see who is here. Before I turn to our moderator, I would like uh, to take this opportunity on behalf of the advisory committee to thank and express our gratitude to the Arts Foundation for the vital support to the forum. I will now turn to our moderator, who is uh, uh, Cheryl Pereira. She's a champion for youth activism around the world to end sexual exploitation and, sexual, and sex trafficking. She's the founder of One Child, Canada. Her full bio is in the com comment threads. Over to you, Cheryl. Thank you, Bukeni. The financial aspects of our work pose big questions indeed. We've all seen the studies and many of them have been discussed earlier this week during the forum. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused many donors and policymakers to shift priorities. Our speakers today can shed light on their own strategic thinking in these uncertain financial times for the human rights field. We're about to have a very rich and thought-provoking session. I'm excited to say that we are joined today by government officials, foundation decision makers, and nonprofit leaders. We have two keynote speakers. Giannina Dinarte Romero is the Costa Rica Minister of Labor and Social Security. Ambassador John Cotton Richmond directs the U.S. State Department's Office to, to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Person. We will turn now to, to today's panelists. Nick Grono is a CEO of the Freedom Fund. Dominique is a program officer with the Pathy Family Foundation. Vijay Simon is the Senior Manager for Forest Labor and Human Trafficking at Humanity United. And Kevin Wilkett is the Deputy Director of the Office of Child Labor, Forced Labor, and Human Trafficking at the U.S. Labor Department's International Labor's Labor Affairs Bureau. Let's turn now to our first keynote address. Costa Rica has become a pathfinder country under the Alliance 8.7 system to end modern slavery at scale in key countries around the world. In charge of that work is Giannina Dinarte Romero. She is Costa Rica's Minister of Labor and Social Security. Now, sadly, Minister Dinarte could not join us live, but we have recorded, we have her recorded her, her address. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank the organization for the invitation to this important discussion. And I send my warmest greetings to all the participants. Costa Rica has committed to the eradication of child labor as part of the Sustainable Development Goals. To achieve this end, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security has worked in close collaboration with the private sector and civil society to raise awareness about this issue. Furthermore, the Ministry has partnered with other institutions to provide, to provide the children and many adolescents the opportunity to continue their educational path and to improve their living conditions through cash transfer programs and social support for the families. Moreover, the government has established institutional mechanisms for the enforcement of laws and regulations on child labor. Alongside these measures, the institutions has been working together with the National Statistics Institute to have more information that allows the institutions 
to strengthen the provisions related to worse forms of child labor. All these efforts reflect the positive outcomes systematically obtained in the last years by reducing the rate of underage employment. In light of these positive achievements, Costa Rica has become the country in Latin America with the lowest participation rate of underage people in labor market. However, as a society, we'll still have significant challenges to overcome the worst forms of child labor and reducing the inequalities within the country. For this reason, within the framework of the Latin America and the Caribbean Free of Child Labor Initiative, the Ministry requests technical assistance to build a model of indicators that allow us to identify the prevalence of child labor within the country. The model includes social and economic variables to determine the vulnerability levels of exposure in different parts of the country, to set, to set up community-based actions based on prioritization levels. The data obtained from this model led to a pilot plan in the province of Limon, in cantons with a significant percentage of indigenous population. The aim is to coordinate actions with different institutions to strengthen the effectiveness of labor regulations and to provide the families with the support they need. Besides, it has been established a timeline with specific objectives to make of Costa Rica a country free of all forms of child labor. To that end, I would like to highlight some of the measures that have been implemented. First of all, the joint effort between the Ministry and the Ministry of Social Affairs that put forward a cash transfer program that targets underage population working so they can continue in the education, in the education system. Second of all, monitoring and technical assistance program for the local governments according to the established by the law co the code of childhood and adolescence that is in a specific law that we have in the country the third point is that we implemented a project focused on indigenous children in the tiny valley la estrella community in the province of limon also, a similar project in the province of Punta Arenas that focus on the improvement of living conditions of the children and their families. Also, it was set up a training program for consulting professionals in the province of Cartago, and it was launched a manual that provides a comprehensive approach for the attention of minors engaged in the worst forms of child labor including in commercial sexual exploitation as a result of human trafficking. And the last one that is important to remark is that we have uh, working in a cooperation agreement that was signed with the Red and Novato Trade Union to raise awareness on topic on this topic. This is part of the of many collaborative work that that have been done on child labor in the public sector and social and civil society organizations. Even though we have made important efforts to achieve these positive indicators, now we have to recognize that we are struggling with a non-precedent emergency that implies tremendous effects, not just in our health, but even in our economy, in the labor market, and in the family's incomes. So it's not enough to speak in terms of sanitary or economic impacts, because we have to talk about the social impact, the consequences in poverty, unemployment, and informalizations torn into a highly risk of social decomposition and in a potential weakness of our democracies. 
and clearly it demands collaboration between the different sectors of our societies. I have to say, in these very easy terms, we need solidarity, dialogue and investment to be resilient and capable, capable of confront this pandemic. The risks are higher because the gaps because the gaps are getting profound because of the changes in the labor situation of millions of people all around the world and the sanitary restrictions that will be reflected in school drop-ups. That's why we have been doing our best efforts to not affect the monetary transfers and to maintain all the programs, recognizing all of them as an investment for the present and for the future. Finally, I would like to reinforce our commitment as country to continue this path to eliminate child labor and to advance to accomplish the sustainable, sustainable development goals, especially the 8.7. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Our thanks to Minister Dinarte. And now to our second keynote speaker today. John Cotton Richmond is the U.S. Ambassador at Large to Monitor and Combat Trafficking Persons. He is the American government's highest official dedicated to fighting modern slavery. He oversees the creation of the annual Trafficking in Persons report from the State Department. And he directs strategic investments to anti-trafficking organizations to conduct projects all around the world. He's a former prosecutor and co-founder of the Human Trafficking Institute. Over to you, Ambassador Richmond. Thanks, Cheryl. It's an honor to join you all today for the fourth day of this Freedom from Slavery Forum. I've actually gotten the opportunity to catch portions of the first few days and been incredibly impressed by the thoughtful array of speakers and the things that these leaders have shared. You know, today's topic, financial and resource mobilization within the anti-trafficking movement, is one that is close to my heart. You know, during my career, I have twice worked in the NGO sector. I have felt the pain of budget limitations. I've made asks of donors. I've walked out of meetings thinking that a major gift was almost certainly coming, only to be disappointed that a donor went another way. I have jumped through the endless bureaucratic hoops of the government grant process, trying to get applications finished at the last minute. And now I serve in an office that oversees about $220 million anti dollars of anti-trafficking grants. So all this is to, is to say that I think a lot about the resources for this movement. And today I'd like to share four ideas that have shaped my understanding around this topic. So the first is what does money follow? You know, the first question um, is just that. Uh, we need to know what money follows. In the beginning of our movement, money seemed to follow emotion. Well-told stories caused passionate people to provide resources because the need was great, yet motion and passion alone are not sustainable. Soon, money began to follow strategy and vision. Donors invested in smart people with thoughtful strategies about how to make a difference. And thought leaders like yourselves developed new approaches around all three Ps of the 3P paradigm. Now, what I'm hearing from donors is they're asking about impact. They're still affected by the emotions and they're impressed with the strategies, but they're asking tough questions like what is working? What interventions are proving to make a practical difference? And how are our anti-trafficking projects different than and more targeted than generalized vulnerability reduction or general development work? I think in the next decade, more than emotion and strategy, money is going to follow impact. This brings me to my second point. To show impact, we have to measure. But what do we measure? Often we measure our activities. How many survivors served? How many police officers were trained? How many posters were distributed, etc.? These activities are helpful, but sophisticated donors want to know the impact or the outcomes of these activities. One possible ruler for measuring impact is prevalence. And for reasons that most of you can articulate off the top of your head, 
most prevalence estimates have suffered significant criticism. In the program to end modern slavery, Congress mandated a category of anti-trafficking grants that are measured by reductions in the prevalence of human trafficking. To accomplish this goal, the State Department realized that we need a new approach to prevalence estimation. Instead of global or national estimates, we needed focused estimates that address a single sector in a specific geographic region. So instead of asking the question, what's the prevalence of human trafficking in Kenya? Perhaps we could ask a more focused question, what's the prevalence of people forced to work as domestic workers in Metro Nairobi? Earlier this week, you heard from David Okesh at the University of Georgia, and they're compiling numerous focused prevalence estimates using different methodologies so that we can compare methodologies to determine which one works best in different industries or in different environments. Notably, all of these estimates are using the same statistical definition that is pegged to the Palermo TVPA definition of trafficking. Each of these studies will be published in peer-reviewed journals and available to researchers. And the researchers are focused on actual cases of human trafficking and not just the vulnerabilities that traffickers find attractive. This represents a big investment in prevalence research. Now, to be clear, prevalence isn't always the best ruler to use when measuring impact. The movement must develop other ways to measure impact in addition to prevalence. But I think the ability to measure impact is essential to resource mobilization. The third idea I'd like to highlight is talent. You know, financial resources are not the scarcest resource in our movement. I think the scarcest resource is talent. Finding, recruiting, and retaining people who know how to finish, who know how to get things done is incredibly challenging. Researchers have long suggested that 20% of people do 80% of the work in an organization. That ratio may be even more extreme in our difficult work. We need to encourage young people to pursue careers in this space and provide work environments that encourage our colleagues to stay in the fight. Passion, good intentions, and being nice people are not sufficient. As the movement continues to mature, we must become more rigorous, more professional, more focused on results and getting things done. Finally, as we seek to scale resources, we need to generate hope. Much of our advocacy focuses on the urgency of the problem that traffickers create. And this is wise. We share about the number of people traffickers exploit, the challenges of trauma, the pitiful numbers around accountability, the challenges of public justice systems, and all the other points that highlight that combating human trafficking is an urgent need. We've become good at communicating urgency, but urgency alone can leave people feeling overwhelmed. It can lead to awareness fatigue, people who understand but quickly become emotionally exhausted. We need to pair our urgency with statements, a sense of possible, of doability. We need to communicate the hope that engagement can make a difference that trafficking is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. It is a man-made crisis and it can be addressed. Donors draw close to urgent problems with interventions that can make a difference. We need urgency and doability. You know, financial and resource mobilization is critical and I look forward to hearing uh, the comments in today's conversation. Thank you for letting me share a little bit about money following impact, measuring matters, the scarcity of talent, and the importance of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Richmond. The ambassador will be back with us later to, to answer our questions. Now let's broaden the conversation about fundraising and resource mobilization with our panelists. Nick Grono of the Freedom Fund, Dominique Chauvet Stacco of the Pathy Family Foundation, Vijay Simon of Humanity United, and Kevin Wilkins of the US Labor Department. What are some of the recent funding trends you're noticing? 
And in light of the pandemic, how are you pivoting and how do you think the pandemic may influence these trends in the coming years? Let's start with you, Nick. The Freedom Fund was set up seven years ago as a pooled philanthropic fund with funding from a number of foundations working in the anti-slavery space. Speak to us, Nick. Tell us what's going on. Okay. Um, so thanks to all of our friends at uh, Free the Slaves. Um, I, uh, I must admit, I first remember this first forum back in uh, Stanford in 2014. So I'm just delighted to see it continuing. Uh, despite the new normal, I just wish we were um, all back together in person in Stanford or anywhere for that matter. Um, but I look forward to perhaps doing that next year. Um, look, on trends, let me identify a, four, a few points. Um, and this is on funding trends. Um, funding for slavery has increased significantly uh, in relative terms over the last six years, but that's from a very, very low base. It's really hard to put numbers on this, but at the Freedom Fund, we estimated in 2015 that there was about $100 million worth of private funding, foundation funding in the space. And my guesstimate would be that that's doubled over the last five years, approximately. And there was about $100 million of government funding that we could identify again about five years ago, which I think is also probably uh, doubled um, over, well, it probably increased a bit more than that. Um, but, you know, you compare that to the needs, you compare that to 40 million people in slavery, you compare to the fact that um, those profiting from slavery make an estimated $120 billion a year from their crime, then, then obviously um, it's, it's a very, very small amount to tackle a very, very big problem. And also if you compare the kind of funding that's on offer compared to other important issues, be it, you know, combating illicit drug trade or migration policy or or you pick your issue in the social justice or development sector, um, you know, it's not a lot of money. Uh, but then there's never going to be enough money, I say, for any of our important issues in, in social justice and development space. Um, and I just have to look at the needs of the public health systems around the world right now. Um, and, and you understand the challenge. Um, so that's, that's kind of the funding that we've got and the funding where it's at. In terms of the impact of the pandemic, um, we put out a report at the Freedom Fund earlier this month looking at the impact of the pandemic on, on groups that we serve. Uh, and obviously the pandemic is having an apps, uh, the pandemic and the lockdowns and the consequent economic pain is having a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable, be it in India, Ethiopia, Brazil, all the places we're working and many others. So, so the needs are, are increasing significantly. Uh, the question in my mind is what's gonna be the impact on funding? Uh, and certainly in the short term, we saw a surge in funding from governments and philanthropists, be it the US government, UK government, uh, a number of the foundations we work with. And, you know, that was really impressive and very, very welcome. Uh, but that's the short term response. We, we, we're all thinking about the, the kind of longer term response over the next, you know, one to five years. And I'm acutely conscious that governments are taking on unprecedented debts to support those in need in their own countries. And there's going to be a reckoning. Uh, and often aid budgets are, are one of the targets when governments are looking to prune their expenditure. Um, the picture is less clear when it comes to private giving. Uh, you know, historically, economic downturns have led to a reduction in giving, particularly individual giving, and, and we certainly saw that play out over the last six months or so. On big foundations, big philanthropic foundations, the picture is less clear. Um, you know, some of the some of the founders, the backers. Um, of big foundations have done well economically over the last five months as the markets have surged. Uh, so that may well play out in their funding. But, you know, overall, if we're talking about kind of extreme economic pressure, um, you know, it's safe to say that um, it's going to be a steady state on the funding uh, front and at best. And, and we should well be planning for significant reductions um, at worst. Given that scenario, then let me just kind of identify two approaches that I think we should all be thinking about in the anti-slavery space, and I'll, I'll finish up on those points. You know, the first pay point echoes the point made by Ambassador Richmond. We just have to make a better case for funders to invest in anti-slavery efforts. If the pie, if the overall funding pie is not expanding, then we have to try and persuade uh, donors to give us bigger slice of the pie. Um, and historically, I don't think the anti-slavery space has done that particularly well. I mean, certainly, you know, I was struck when I entered the space about seven or eight years ago, a really powerful emotional case around trafficking and slavery. And that's, that's obvious and, and, and it is powerful. 
but there really wasn't a lot being done on the impact side of the equation. It was almost as if you make a big emotional pitch, that's enough. Well, sophisticated donors, governments uh, require more, uh, and they'll certainly require more in a tightened financial environment. And we've seen a big investment over the last five years in data and evidence, prevalence studies, um, all from a very low base. Um, but certainly at the Freedom Fund, you know, that's been a, a key push and a key approach for us is improve the kind of, improve the evidence on impact, improve the thinking around impact, and it helps you make a case for greater investment. And then the second point I'd make, or the second approach I think we should be thinking more of is, is um, allying more care more closely with other sectors and causes. And this is not always easy, but it's something, again, we've been giving a lot of thought to. You know, if you care about the marine environment and depleted fish stocks, you should care about the use of forced labor to strip the oceans and vice versa. If you care about deforestation and climate change, you should care about forced labor gangs being used in Brazil to cut down the forest. Um, and also, if you look at approaches, you know, if you look at the tools, I spent a lot of time looking at the tools that are being used to combat climate change, things like strategic litigation, targeting investors, setting benchmarks. And these can all be readily applied to the anti-slavery space to big effect and in a coordinated way. So I think there are many ways to make a stronger case for the anti-slavery initiatives linked to things like childhood education, public health response in the pandemic, safer migration and so on. And it's not easy and you don't wanna make overly tenuous claims. But if you do it well, then you're actually expanding the pie, not just taking a larger slice. And I think we all benefit from that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your insights, Nick. Let's move to Dominique. For the past 10 years, the Pathy Family Foundation has been partnering with organizations to end human trafficking, both in Canada and globally. Tell us, Dominique, from a family philanthropy perspective, what are you seeing and how are you pivoting? Uh, thank you, Cheryl, and uh, good morning to today's uh, distinguished panelists and to all foreign participants. I, I think the pandemic has set the stage for private donors to transform their funding strategies and to be more proactive. Like Nick mentioned, I think we're seeing shifts in positioning and in grant making practices and family philanthropy that are creating opportunities for donors to rethink how they can be more effective allies in supporting their grantee partners in the anti-slavery movement. The corona pandemic is having widespread and devastating impact across the globe. Loss of life, economic crisis, and social disruption have shocked the world. It has not only revealed the inequities of vulnerable communities, but also exacerbated them. As we have heard during the past few days of the forum, the pandemic has created many challenges for those working to end human trafficking and slavery. Our community-based partners have borne the brunt of the crisis, having to adapt their service delivery and provide relief services for their communities while struggling to keep up as they face program shutdowns and potential loss of revenue. There is a major concern that many advances painstakingly acquired after years of hard work on key social issues to protect human rights, protect women and children from abuse and exploitation might be rolled back or lost. However, one positive effect of the pandemic is that the donor community responded quickly and meaningfully. Many donors, including the Pathy Family Foundation, were able to rapidly shift their grant making processes and priorities to respond to the crisis and to support grantee partners in the most unprecedented manner. Foundations like ourselves provided quick emergency and flexible funding to support grantees who overnight became the lifeline of their communities and who needed to adapt to their new reality. Grantee partners were encouraged to repurpose or reallocate existing grant funds for their immediate needs or realign grant agreements to allow for changes in projects as a result of lockdown measures. We, amplified application, we simplified applications, relaxed grant agreements, funding restrictions, and extended reporting deadlines. We also increased communications with partners. One positive outcome of confinement is increased opportunities to, in, to connect and to learn from each other. Regular conversations were held with our grantee partners to hear about how they were coping in the field. We also redoubled collaboration with other donors. Foundations in Quebec came together, regardless of philanthropic focus, with pooled funds to help community-based organizations to counter the impacts of the pandemic. Philanthropic Foundations Canada, an association of private donors, similar to the Council on Foundations of the United States, 
developed a set of guiding principles to assist foundations in supporting their grantees during the crisis, and these were immediately endorsed by the philanthropic community. There was a renewed realization that donors cannot do this alone and that siloed interventions had to be avoided at all costs. In this, um, in this moment, I believe the donors are keen to work more in collaboration and closer with the communities, particularly those rendered more vulnerable by the pandemic. I have spoken to several private family philanthropists and stakeholder partners in my immediate sphere, and there are several tendencies that are emerging in the philanthropic community that are strengthening donor-grantee partnerships and leading to meaningful prospects for resourcing the anti-slavery and anti-trafficking work, as well as the intersecting issues of the movement. I would like to highlight a few. First, donors are realizing that it is possible to forego procedures and structures that overburden the grant selection and monitoring process. There have been calls to do this for years, but many foundations are just reflecting on these and applying these practices now. This is particularly encouraging for grassroots organizations without dedicated resources needed to fulfill burdensome requirements. And we know that there are many in the movement. Second, we're seeing a movement to provide more unrestricted and core funding. It is an acknowledgement that frontline organizations know how best to allocate resources needed to serve their community. Increasing unrestricted giving translates into deepening trust and working more closely with local organizations and to include them in decision-making. In this era of travel restrictions, virtual meeting platforms are making dialogue between stakeholders possible and donors can enable the digital transformations of their grantee partners to facilitate this. Thirdly, donors want to grant more and grant differently. The increase in philanthropic donations during the pandemic has been well-documented. There are signs that intensified spending, spending beyond the required percentage of endowments will continue past the pandemic, whenever that will be. Foundations are reassessing their giving strategies and are expected to provide increased and longer term funding to address complex, complex social and economic issues. There is also a realization that traditional project funding models are not working. Now is the time, donors are saying, to test and to try new approaches, to innovate and to take on more risk. Fourthly, donors are seeing a role for themselves as catalysts for change. In this era of great social upheaval, philanthropy is being challenged to commit towards advancing a more just and equitable society. The sector is being called out to be more proactive in breaking down systems and power structures that have enabled racism, inequity, and injustice. Modern slavery and human trafficking are one of the world's greatest human rights abuses, and in my opinion, appropriate areas for, to tackle for donors who have embraced community activism and social justice causes. Finally, there is a willingness among donors to collaborate, not only with each other, but with business, corporations, civil society, and even government. Donors are seeing the imperative of working together across sectors to support system change work for the long term. Shared expertise, pooled funding, collective impact projects, and other collaborative platforms to fund this work will be more widespread in the future. These are just but some of the general philanthropic tendencies that I have observed in my part of the world. While all of this might seem quite promising, I am cautiously optimistic for the future as we are navigating through much uncertainty. There are still ways to go, and it does not mean that there aren't challenges ahead or that donors will not revert to their old ways once the crisis is over. There are also signs of some foundations taking a more inward view and concerned only with what is happening inside their own community. Similarly, some of these trends are certainly not new, but taking lessons from the pandemic, there is evidence of concrete action of donors walking the talk and a responsiveness to move more meaningfully and with humility along these lines. To quote a partner, donors want to do more and want to do better, especially now in the context of the pandemic and beyond, as there is urgency to effectively address the consequences that are unfolding for trafficking victims and vulnerable groups before they become too critical than they already are. Thank you. And back to you, Cheryl. Thank you for your insights, Dominique. Vijay, let's hear from you. What are the trends you're seeing among fellow foundations and within your own foundation? How are you shifting priorities? So 
Sure. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Cheryl. I uh, first thanks to, uh, for the opportunity to speak at the Freedom uh, from Slavery Forum. Certainly appreciated, and really looking forward to the to the panel discussion. Um, I, I appreciate the framing of this session as you know the examination, at least partly, of what funders can do to keep the movement resource. But I think, as Dominique was kind of highlighting, it's not just funding the movement, but how the movement gets funded that's really important. And I think that's becoming more and more apparent to donors uh, if that hadn't already been the case prior to the pandemic. So I'll really quickly talk about two things. Um, one, how Humanity United is and has been adapting our work uh, as a result of the pandemic and, get, and in, a, in an effort to get resources to the field. Uh, and then secondly, I'll talk about a donor collaborative called FORGE that HU is a part of that launched this summer and how FORGE as a donor collaborative had to pivot both operationally and programmatically as a result of, of the pandemic. So um, really quickly on Humanity United, a lot of it is really similar to what, um, to what Dominique ju just mentioned about her foundation. Um, so much of our shifts have been both on an operational level and a programmatic level uh, as we've seen the pandemic really affect um, workers and survivors and our partners uh, and and other foundations as, as Nick was noting you know different um, donors have been affected very differently and they've reacted very differently um, so some of the things that we've done I, at least four that come to mind for me one was similar to to, to Dominique's point it's about making uh, more flexible grant making practices. So a lot of shifting from project specific support to general operating support, expedited processes, that sort of thing. Um, we've also tried to do a, a lot more responsive grant making. Um, you know, there has been as a result of the pandemic, you know, operational changes in the way that HU functions, a lot less travel, a lot less, um, you know, use of office space. So how can we quickly even repurpose the resources that we have that we would have put towards other things to our grantees? Um, and so an example is that a, a partner reached out to us and said, there are workers that are stranded in a specific space. Uh, they're in real dire need of food and medicine and how can we get that to them as quickly as possible? And so we were able to pivot very quickly and get resources to them uh, in the form of grant funding. The third one is, a, is really a, a journey that I think HU started a couple of years ago, but is really accelerated as a result of the pandemic. And that's really examining how diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice principles are, are incorporated into our grant making and our partnerships. So that means sort of looking at what is the landscape of, of our grantees look like? Are we you know, appropriately partnering directly with organizations that are you know, in more in closer proximity to the, to the communities that we serve? Or are we actually partnering you know, disproportionately with more Western um, uh, US-based or European-based organizations. Uh, and then lastly, the, the other thing that we're kind of keeping our eye on programmatically is what are the emerging, you know, opportunities? Where's the momentum programmatically that we can potentially, um, you know, press down on uh, to get some additional impact? And, you know, that an example of that might be, at least in the forced labor space, you know, there's a lot of attention to essential workers now and the importance that they play in the economy uh, and in the services that are provided that we all take for granted. Is that attention to essential services an opportunity that we can use to push for uh, broader social protections, as an example? So, uh, you know, I think Dominique's point around like, these are changes that foundations have made. How long these changes continue at foundations remains to be seen. I think that's a question that HU we're also thinking about. Um, the second, the, so uh, that's one piece. Uh, Dominique also mentioned sort of donor collaboration. That's the other area that HU is really, um, I think accelerated as well is how we're partnering with other donors. And so I'll really quickly share um, some slides here. I hope folks can see this. Um, but uh, HU is a part of a donor collaborative and that donor collaborative is called FORGE um, and FORGE stands for Funders Organized for Rights in the Global Economy. And as you can see um, from the, the, the slide here, you know, FORGE launched um, pa this past summer uh, and the vision really is about a global economy that works for all the people and planet and is shaped by and accountable to worker and community-led movements. 
Um, and so just to really quickly go through this, I'll, I'll just talk about the vision of Forge and then um, give you a sense of what collaboration and resource mobilization, mobilization looks like within Forge. Um, and if you wanna learn more about it, you can visit that website, forgefunders.org. Um, what collaboration looks like in Forge, at least our anticipated collaboration was gonna happen in three areas. One was in the creation of a, of a learning agenda. And this was really meant as an opportunity for donors to share insights, um, strategies, uh, knowledge developed with and for the field. And that includes both you know, known voices and new voices. Um, and it's also a chance to identify and scope emerging issues, opportunities and needs in the field. The learning agenda is one of those areas that I think we're going to continue to build out into 2021. Um, the, the other area of collaboration is around aligned strategies. And you know, we really feel that there is potential for greater impact by donors coming together, sharing approaches, sharing strategies, and aligning funding more strategically. Um, it's also possible that through aligned funding, we can explore new opportunities and seed efforts that may war warrant scaling in the future. And similarly to, to the learning agenda, we're hoping to continue to build out uh, the aligned strategy piece in 2021. The, the last area is around pooled funding. And with pooled funding, the, the driver for that was essentially that individually philanthropic institutions um, may not be able to support a full range of necessary interventions in a strategic way, but by pooling funds, we can potentially support a wider range of interventions. Um, what's interesting here is that, you know, a lot of Ford started with just informal conversations amongst donors and staff and basically saying, oh, well, you're funding this organization. Well, we're funding them. Oh, you're working on this issue. Well, we're working on this issue. And I think there was a desire for a more formal way in which that collaboration could happen. And Ford's really started in 2018. Um, and I think we very much had the intention at the end of 2019 to really think about the learning agenda and the aligned strategies. But then um, in February and March of this year, when the pandemic hit, we really felt like we needed to pivot quickly. And so the last thing I'll say is that um, as you look at the, the list of members that are in Forge, um, is that the pooled fund is really an example of how the pandemic really prompted us to shift our focus. So initially, as I mentioned, we were going to focus on other things, but um, because we felt like getting resources to the field was the most important thing and something we needed to do quickly, we launched um, this past summer both Forge and the Response and Vision Fund, which was uh, essentially established as, a COVID as the COVID-19 pandemic elevated a lot of the issues that are at the heart of Forge's work. Um, you can read more about the fund if you go to the website um, and happy to answer any questions that folks might have about it. But um, maybe I'll, I'll pause here and pass it back to you, Cheryl. Wonderful. Thank you, Vijay. ILAB is an active funder of projects around the world to combat child labor and forced labor. Kevin, let's hear from your perspective. What's going on? Thanks, Cheryl. And I wanted to thank Bukeni and Free the Slaves for inviting ILAB to be a part of this panel. Um, as, as has been noted, the impact of the global pandemic has been particularly severe for already vulnerable populations. Populations most at, most at risk of abusive labor practices like child labor and forced labor have been made even more vulnerable. According to a joint report by UNICEF and the ILO, for every percentage point rise in poverty, child labor is likely to increase by 0.7 percentage points or more. And we know the number of people at risk is growing. In ILAB, we have seen many impacts of COVID on our ongoing programming. And iLab, we're currently funding about 40 projects in 40 countries um, and over $200 million in, in active programming. Projects to combat child labor and forced labor have needed to adjust activities as schools have closed or access has become more limited. Uh, adult family members have lost jobs, which has reduced household income. We know that resources for social protection programs, which are so important right now, uh, have been stretched more thin than ever. And monitoring and workplace inspections have decreased and become more challenging. In iLab, 
we have worked with our grantees to try to use the resources that are already allocated because we know there's an urgency and those are resources that we can put to work right now um, through flexibilities to address critical needs that make vulnerable children and families more vulnerable. Some of the ways that we have um, repurposed or focused our, our programming money that's already out there have included uh, support for food security for families, awareness raising of COVID related risks. Uh, could I have the first slide? In this slide uh, in Paraguay, a project we are supporting with Partners of the Americas to address child labor and forced labor has launched a communications campaign on COVID-19 using SMS text messaging and radio-based public service announcements to disseminate information on self-care and what to do if COVID symptoms are identified among workers. The project is also collaborating with local journalists to translate messages into indigenous languages. Next slide. In Nepal, the Sakriya project implemented by World Education International and in Colombia, the Somos Tesoro project implemented by PACT, uh, which is pictured here, have moved face, from face-to-face -face classes to online trainings. We've also seen vocational training focused on safe and viable alternatives um, in the era of COVID. So this has been training where uh, programs have looked to see what can youth, for instance, uh, of legal working age, what can they do that allows them to earn income but not be put at greater risk because they're working. And we, we all know this is something that is a reality in, in, in countries around the world. Uh, next slide. And we have supported many projects that are providing um, personal protective equipment. And this is important whether we're talking about occupational safety and health and for those who have to be working so they can be safer. It's also important in communities where if families don't have resources to protect themselves, uh, parents are more likely to be sick. And if that happens, we know that children are gonna be even more vulnerable. ILAB has also been looking for ways as a donor uh, to adjust our approach to new programming. We've been allowing applicants latitude to propose innovative approaches to address COVID related issues that are affecting the target populations we work with. Recognizing that project development is more difficult for grantee organizations um, during these times when travel to communities and face-to-face -face meetings are often not possible. When governments are already so pressed in terms of the work they're doing that it may be difficult to re reach certain officials. So we've incorporated language um, that takes that into account. We've also included language in our funding opportunity announcements that allows for additional refinement of strategies post-award uh, because we know this situation is continuing to evolve and what we think are the essential interventions today, they may need to change by the time a project's being implemented. Um, or we may need to look at that implementing environment and realize that it too has changed. In the face of these challenges, we have seen the value of using these kinds of existing support networks that organizations have uh, to assist communities. These networks can be critical for mobilizing and delivering urgently need resources. We have also seen the value of mainstreaming understanding of child labor, forced labor, and other forms of modern day slavery. So that broader efforts to address issues related to COVID-19 issues related to uh, education, to health, uh, that all of these types of interventions which are going on, they need to take into account the circumstances, the needs and the vulnerabilities of the populations who are most at risk of, of modern day slavery, of child labor and forced labor. And we need to see more partnerships, which has been just mentioned and I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, we need public and private sector actors and civil society working together so that we can be more effective, so that we can leverage one another's experience, the expertise, and as we're talking about today, so we can leverage resources to make them go further. 
And in that vein about making resources go further, I wanted to mention a few of the free resources that Department of Labor makes available. Next slide. Our Sweat and Toil app puts all of our research that we do on child labor and forced labor into the palm of your hands, which this is over a thousand pages of research. And at times like this, we all need to harness the power of information. We need to understand the circumstances and the, and the groups that need us most. Next slide. And our Comply Chain app provides company and industry groups with practical guidance to develop robust social compliance plans. So again, it's important to be working with the private sector and we hope this tool can be of assistance. You can get more information about our apps and all of our work from our website. And, and again, we encourage you to download these apps. They're widely available, they're free. And at times like we, these, we think that uh, we hope that more people will be educating themselves about the issues of modern day slavery, about child labor and forced labor, uh, and that together we can be more effective by using the information that's out there. Uh, but as is mentioned, we need to continue to gather information as the circumstances change. So thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Kevin, especially for those resources. Those are great. Uh, we will now move to the next part of the session and open the floor to our audience for questions and answers. Ambassador Richmond has joined us again. We welcome everyone's questions, so please put them in the Q&A thread and we can then call on you to unmute your microphone to join the discussion. I'd like to call on Matthew Clark. Matthew, uh, we have a question from you and we're going to unmute your mic. Yeah, and Ambassador Richmond, thank you for your presentation and, and for your longstanding contribution to the field. Um, my uh, question is about uh, funding for testing innovative new ideas. Uh, you spoke about the need for outcome-based impact measures, and there are some cases where you're trying to, to uh, establish a, a new uh, type of intervention for anti-slavery where there is no proven outcome. What, so what funds are you aware of that are specifically for testing new ideas, and what should the anti-slavery movement be doing to motivate funds for those purposes? No, it's a really thoughtful question. I think there are a couple of places um, to go, but I think largely it's less about a specific fund and more about a framing of the um, of the program. So in terms of, of where to go to test new ideas, we've got a couple uh, at the State Department. We tried to respond to the COVID pandemic uh, by creating a brand new, very flexible and responsive COVID fund um, to allow um, NGOs, even for smaller awards than we would normally give, apply for funding to help them um, deal with the impacts of the pandemic and the global shutdown as they're trying to continue their programs. Um, and we've, it's a rolling fund, unlike any other fund that the State Department has done out of the Trafficking in Persons Office that would allow them to be funded as they come in. And we've received the first round of those and are reviewing them. And there we are looking for innovative ways. The other thing I would just say is that even if it's a new idea, a new intervention, if, if the way we're framing it to the donors is that it can have a impact and we've got a strategy to show not just that we're doing a good and worthy activity, but that that good and worthy activity is going to result in a significant change. Um, I think that is the type of framing that donors find attractive, whether it's private donors or whether it's institutional or government donors. And so I think a lot of it is framing around not just the need being urgent again, but in addition to the need being urgent that the activities we're asking people to fund are going to make a difference. Um, and I think that we do need new and innovative ideas. Uh, we need folks to continue to try things. Um, and we're certainly in a posture at the State Department of trying to think about um, how to encourage organizations to take risks, um, but they need to be targeted risks. They need to be risks aimed at change. Thank you, Ambassador Richmond. We have a, another question uh, from Afrin Sultana Chowdhury. Um, if you're there, uh, we will just unmute your mic. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, good morning, good day to everyone because we are in a different time zone. We often want to see as a fundraiser uh, and also as a donor to showcase the impact. But when it comes to impact, the funding is uh, 
more and the volume needs to be higher than the previous projects. Uh, at the same time, donors do not want to fund in the impact because impact needs to be shown within five to 10, 10 years. Donors have the trend to see the changes within very shortest possible time. Uh, other than education in other development sector with migration, trafficking, they want instant, instant solutions and impacts. But behavior change within a singular person and also within a committee takes time. So how do we negotiate with donors? And also how do we actually bring changes in the project design that does meet the need of the donor and continue the funding over the years? I agree with you. I think that um, there's a crisis in philanthropy and development when it comes to uh, grant makers wanting to see things change in 12, 24 month or even 36 month time periods. I don't think history has shown that that works. And so I think we have to educate them. We have to communicate in a way uh, to let them know that our projects need to be longer in time, larger in scope, um, and that what is worthy of that investment is that our strategies have improved and we can actually show results. Um, and so at the State Department, we have, we have shifted to trying to do fewer, larger, longer projects, where instead of addressing um, a prosecution effort in one country, a protection effort in another, a prevention effort in a third country, could we address all three of the P's at the same time, in the same place, knowing that they're mutually reinforcing um, and they depend upon one another? Uh, you can see this, we've made a, a, a large investment in Ethiopia re re recently through several different of our funding mechanisms. And we've just announced um, a large $15 million single country project in Costa Rica, which is the State Department's largest ever program. Now we're limited in time by five years. The regulations say that's the maximum amount of time we're able to do. But even there, we can think creatively um, as government offices about how to ladder or stack multiple grants over a period of time to get to a longer project. But the projects have to be worthy of the larger investment. And so I think both are true. We have to get funders to have a bigger time horizon and have an imagination for what can change. But as implementers, we also have to have a bigger vision and a more strategic approach. Thank you, Ambassador. We have a question from Loretta Ogboro Okor. Loretta, if you're there, we will unmute your mic. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Loretta. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Loretta Boroko. I'm one of the PhD students in Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. I was just asking because there's something that has bothered me. In these COVID times, measuring impacts in, um, um, in interventions in some confounding factors that I have noted, like in Nigeria, like um, um, people who have to take oaths. Um, before they travel that ties them psychologically to the traffickers. Um, in these COVID times, how would we do that? Because previously we would have gone to where the oath takers are, speak to them and have like a focus group discussion to see where they are. But with COVID, many of them are not computer literate. These are people in their house houses. Are there any ideas as to how we could, I mean, being in this conference, just to see what others think of this kind of thing in, in the wake of the current times? Uh, maybe I could just offer some of what we've seen from some of the projects that we fund at the Department of Labor, uh, because we've seen the grantee organizations that we work with have really used their networks of local organizations. Uh, and as I was mentioning earlier, we've also been using radio and, and other forms of communication that might be more widely accessible. Um, to those who might not have uh, the access to computers uh, or be computer literate. Uh, we're also looking at you know, ways to use indigenous languages when, when that's needed for the most vulnerable. So I, I think at this time, the value of existing networks and partners who, who really have um, the connections on the grounds and, and can offer ideas about how we can can reach out uh, when it is, like you said, so difficult to have face-to-face -face meetings, um, to come from a, the capital, to go to a remote area. Uh, we need to see who is in place, who can be a partner at these times. So we've found that to be very important. 
So I just wanted to follow up on Kevin's point because I think it is a really low, uh, important um, point. You know, COVID has had such a destructive uh, impact in so many ways, particularly on the most vulnerable communities. But it also um, has demonstrated the power of a localization model. Uh, you know, there is a real power to working with local partners, frontline partners, and trusting that they will identify ways to, um, you know, address these new challenges. Uh, and certainly our experience at the Freedom Fund, where we partner with and fund over 100 local organizations, is that that's where you get the innovation. You know, and local partners will identify, are there ways of socially distancing that they can still achieve the objectives they're trying to achieve? Are there ways they can reach other stakeholders? You know, how can they engage with local officials to intervene in a way that they might not have before? Um, so, you know, there is a versatility and a power around that model. And I think for funders, um, one of the key lessons out of, out of this whole pandemic is that, um, you know, more thought should be given to funding those kinds of initiatives. If I could just add, um, in our experience, we've seen that um, the travel bans have actually freed up um, resources for you know, local organizations to pursue digital transformation, um, you know, upgrades and, and really invest in technology. And we also see that in areas where there isn't um, coverage, for example, that local organizations are quite creative in uh, maintaining communications with their networks. Uh, for example, we've seen WhatsApp um, is really being widely spread as a means of communicating and also of um, reaching out to, um, you know, constituents in the networks and in the communities. Wonderful. Thanks, Dominique. We do have another question coming in from Emily Wyman. Emily, if you're there, we're going to unmute your mic. Yes, hi, thanks very much. Um, I guess this is primarily directed at VJ. Um, I was wondering how the funding collaborative model um, that you outlined, which I find very compelling, so aligned learning st agenda strategies and pooled funding, how that can be kind of most effectively and perhaps most efficiently expanded, particularly given that it's speaking to multiple, I think, concerns amongst the anti uh, across the anti-slavery sector. Um, about you know needing to enable a wider set of interventions to occur, reducing redundancy in activities and so on. So how can that model be most effectively and efficiently expanded in your view? Thanks, uh, thanks, Emily. It's a it's a great question. I, I I think you know to your to your question about how can it be um, most effectively uh, expanded. I would say um, very carefully. Right, um, you know it's almost one of those things where you go slow to go fast. Um, partly, you know, I think so much of that as is related to like how best to engage organizations that are most proximate to the work that that's being done. Um, I, I think up in, uh, to sort of take a step back on the donor side, you know, so much of um, donor uh, alignment or pooling of funds um, tends to be ad hoc, right? Just conversations between grant makers that might happen about a very specific project or a very specific geography. I think a little bit more careful thinking about how that can be done more strategically, um, more complementary, more in partnership as well with um, the organizations that are on the front lines. Uh, and that means that means letting go of the reins a little bit. I think even going back to some of the previous questions around like monitoring and evaluation and like being able to track progress uh, and that question of like trust-based philanthropy, right? Putting more trust in the, in the organizations that are doing the work. Um, and I think for us also, it's about um, field engagement, right? Like how do you bring, when so many of these foundations are based in places like DC and New York or London or San Francisco, how do you bring um, folks that are in quote, like global South um, uh, geographies into that conversation in a way that's meaningful and not extractive. Um, and I think the last piece is on really aligning around some of those key elements or key subject matter areas, right, that affect the global economy. And that means, you know, connecting movements as an example, right, like so often labor movements have operated separately from movements on, de on gender justice or on environmental justice. Um, or on racial justice for that matter. And uh, clearly there's overlap amongst these. And so finding ways in which you can actually connect some of those movements local to global or global to local uh, is really important. And then, um, you know, 
I, I don't want to jump ahead, but you know, as, as I, th I think you saw from Sienna's question as well, um, around like the extractive nature of global south towards the or global north towards the global south. Um, I think it's also about really holding to account some of the some of the um, you know financial actors that are in the, the financial sector, the corporation, corporate accountability, corporate pressure to sort of be a, a good citizen um, in you know in this space, both in the trafficking space and the labor rights space. And so um, that thoughtfulness that we're trying to apply, I think, is the way in which um, we can expand. Um, and and I think that's where uh, outside voices from other other donors that we'd love to have you know be a part of the process is is certainly helpful because it helps shape that that thinking. So um, that's that's really quickly a, a little bit of my sense. But keen if others had different perspectives as well on in their experience with donor collaboratives, because I know there's many of them out there. Thank you, Vijay. On to our next question. Uh, this is coming from Smith Maxime. Um, Smith, are you there? We'll unmute your mic. Yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, in your experiences, uh, do you witness any kind of geographical funding focus or geographical imbalance in terms of funding opportunity? Um, Cheryl, can I, I mean, I'll have a shot at that, but I, I also want to address Sienna's question, uh, which is uh, listed on the Q&A as well, um, which is about, um, you know, the extractive nature of, uh, of um, the Global North's experience and, um, and um, you know, um, there's a whole lot of questions going on now. I mean, I think I think all of us in the space need to be much more cognizant of you know the legacy of structural racism, of colonialism, uh, and and just the extractive nature of a lot of the uh, exploitation that's gone on. Um, I think that one way of ad not addressing it, but one way of approaching it, obviously, is to provide resources at a scale to make a real difference on these issues and those resources should follow, and this gets to uh, Maxim's question, you know, should follow where the greatest need is. Uh, and to get the greatest need, obviously we have to have better data on prevalence and all the rest of it. But it, it, it's a lot more than that. And funding inherently um, brings to it a power relationship. And this was what PJ was kind of touching on so, so thoughtfully. Uh, and I think funders, and we're a funder, um, have to be a lot more cognizant of their power and how it's exercised. Uh, it's part of the reason why, you know, I make a plea, we make a plea at the Freedom Fund for localization, i.e. Uh, ensuring that uh, the voices of those that we're trying to work with and support are genuinely embedded in the whole process, not as a kind of tick box consultation exercise, but in the decision making process. Um, I also think that we have to look at a lot more of the power issues that, uh, that we confront when we really get to grips with slavery and trafficking for labor and supply chains of transnational organizations. Uh, again, the whole financial institutions role, not necessarily kind of conscious exploitation, but often a an, negligence to the consequences of their action that amounts to much the same. Um, so I think kind of focusing on some of those issues much more openly, and it is happening, it's happening slowly, and obviously Black Lives Matter and a lot of the focus and attention on these issues is, is raising awareness. Um, we work closely with Humanity United and I've been struck with how thoughtful they are at looking at the whole diversity, equity, inclusion and justice kind of piece of it. And other funders are as well. Um, it's got a long, long way to go. People don't like giving up power. People don't like surrendering power, even those that are uh, very well intentioned. Um, but uh, we'll be doing um, those that we are trying to work with a huge disservice if we are not a lot more thoughtful uh, and explicit about it. Great, thank you, Nick. We have a, our next question is from an anonymous person. And the question is, how open are donors to alternative rigorous approaches to identifying impact? We lost for a second, sorry. <laughs> uh, how, yes, how open are donors to alternative rigorous approaches to identifying impact besides prevalence? While Freedom Fund has supported process tracing, would family foundations and other donors expect impact measures for their increased funding of the vitally important and equitable non-restricted funds? Um, I think that uh, right now, um, philanthropy, especially family foundations, 
most likely have to change the definition of what they mean by impact um, measures. The pandemic really has uh, changed the perspective on everything. And I certainly think that once foundations really take the time to re-examine and redefine what they mean by impact, I think that that will most likely create um, increased funding opportunities uh, for organizations um, who are doing the work on the ground and also uh, be able to easily get more uh, unrestricted funding. Cheryl, could I also add something? Please do. Uh, so I wanted to mention that at the Department of Labor, as we've tried to look at uh, this, you know, the question of impact, we funded a, a number of impact evaluations over the years, and we found those to be extremely useful for trying to get at um, this question. But we've also found that, I, I think as the panelists uh, know, the impact evaluations are, are very complex. Um, they, they take uh, a lot of time and they, um, so we've, we've learned that we have to be very targeted um, in how we're trying to use them, as well as being flexible to, to look at other ways uh, that organizations may want to um, uh, try to address this question of impact. Um, so I think we need to use the most rigorous methods, but we also need to be open to innovation um, as organizations try to figure out how they can blend um, providing direct services or building capacity um, of organizations on the ground with how they can show impact. Um, I, I think we need to look at all the tools that are out there. And, and I know we, we welcome hearing from organizations about new ideas they have in this space. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Kev uh, um, Kevin. Um, our next our next question comes from Palabi Ghosh. Palabi, are you there? Wonderful. Go ahead. Yeah. So I have been working as an activist in anti-trafficking. So I've worked with both established and new organizations. I have seen that there's a big difference with established organizations. When we apply for a grant or a fund, we see that it's approved, but Whereas I have seen that when I have sent a proposal from a new organization, which has just started two years or three years back, they do not get funds. So is there any way, like, can I understand what is the reason behind it? Or there's a way to judge the organization due to which we don't get funds? Um, Cheryl, maybe I can um, do my best here, at least, or at least speak from the perspective of, of some of the hurdles that we face. I know that, you know, from the Humanity United side, as we try to fund organizations that are, are potentially based outside of the US, there are, as Apollaby was saying, a number of hurdles that we have to face. And a lot of that is um, from the perspective of like IRS reporting, for example. Um, and, you know, in essentially establishing for an overseas organization what's like an equivalency dis determination so that they can be sort of seen as a US 501c3. Um, so that we can transfer funds to them. The alternative, you know, becomes even more burdensome at times for grantees, which is um, a very reporting intensive kind of grant making process. Uh, and so I think one of the ways that we're in the process of thinking about this and, and have tried to be a little bit more um, intentional is uh, finding ways to try and expedite that. Are there potential ways in which we can um, streamline other aspects of, of our uh, grant making process, the application process? And also, I think this is where the, the trust issue comes back into play. I think there's just an, um, a bit of uh, desire to kind of focus on the grant grantees that are known, um, or maybe to some extent like donor darlings, um, as opposed to at times investing in some of the new emerging grantees. And I think that's really critical in that field building piece that we're talking about um, and, and building out organizations that serve different communities, that provide different services to communities. And so, um, I, you know, it's a, it's a, unfortunately, probably it's a pretty unsatisfactory answer. I think that really the burden in a lot of ways is on grant grant makers and donors to, to be a little bit more um, thoughtful and, and better approach, um, you know, funding new organizations. Um, thanks. Cheryl, can I add something from Department of Labor? Um, just building, I, I agree with Vijay as he, as he was talking about the complexity that can be involved 
with applying for um, U.S. government grants um, because I, I, there are a lot of parts to the process. And one of the things that we've seen is that sometimes local organizations that have begun uh, by working with a larger organization as a partner, um, and then they they learn more about the process, uh, both in terms of applying as well as reporting. Um, because a small local organization uh, that has to go through all the reporting requirements, um, that could be very daunting. So I th think we've seen some lo local organizations that have really done well by partnering with a large organization that has that experience. And then as they have developed more experience themselves, then when they go into the competitions, uh, they, they know how to put their best foot forward. They know how to make sure they don't miss any of the requirements that, that could lead to a, an application not being considered. Um, so I would just put that out there. Um, it is complex. We, we try to put out resources so that applicants can understand the process. Um, but but learning on the job with another organization can also be real, really valuable. So I just wanted to note that. Um, can I just quickly add, um, I agree with uh, both uh, uh, Kevin and Vijay. There isn't really a logical explanation to, you know, a logical answer to your question. But I think that in the interest of transparency, um, organizations who have been uh, refused for funding, they should ask the donor the reasons why. And I think the donors um, should explain not only the process, they should also explain what are the criteria, and they should also help the applicant to better understand um, you know, what are the things that they can do to improve so that the next time they can increase their chances of getting, you know, at least some funding or at least being directed to other resources where they can potentially get uh, funding from, from other foundations or, or other donors. Our next question is from Lorenta Eagle. Are you there, Lorenta? Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is Lorenza and I'm speaking from the UK. I'm a student interested in human trafficking research. And then I have two questions. The first question is um, relating to, um, can, can you share some strategies on what components or elements that should be looked at in trying to understand what it will take to cost or to understand what it will cost to end human trafficking in a particular country? So that's my first question, if any of the panelists can help with that. And then the second question is on the issue of um, the emerging trend that is very visible for many parts, particularly in the source countries, where we have development partners or funders um, exploiting the vulnerabilities of the vulnerable people and then um, costing um, or pre preparing grants or using the situation, the worst situation that people are enduring for their benefit. Because looking at trafficking, tra human trafficking or ending trafficking, we have to look at how we can address the money aspect and the market aspect. So I, I want to ask that, is there any like global regulation or is it something that um, is worth putting into consideration to checkmate the activities of funders and development partners and then what, what, what would you want to say about that? Would anybody like to comment? I'll have a shot at the first question, <laughs> uh, which is a great one, you know, and in fact, I was waiting in case Ambassador wanted to come in because I know US State Department has a strategy that is doing a lot of thinking about how can we target resources and interventions on particular countries such as Costa Rica or Ethiopia. Uh, to drive a big measurable change. Uh, we're working in Ethiopia with, uh, with JTIP um, and you know, it's quite exciting to see a mobilization of resources at a scale with local partners and others to start answering the question about what happens when you have long-term interventions with a lot of thought, with an ability to change, can you make a big measurable difference? Because we still haven't answered that question in the anti-trafficking space. Um, on the second question, I'm not sure exactly which part, or uh, let me just have a shot at a bit of it. You know, 
And it comes back to this issue of power, right? Powerful actors with lots of money have to be acutely conscious of that power and all of the negative effects it can have if it's not done thoughtfully. So I don't know about specific examples of funders um, engaging in trafficking-like behavior, but you know, we've all heard and um, horrendous stories about international actors, be they peacekeepers or others coming into a region and themselves contributing to and exploiting highly vulnerable people. Um, there isn't, as far as I'm aware, any kind of global regulation against that, but there are all sorts of rules and regulations about appropriate behavior of funders and other international actors and the ways in which they intervene. Uh, and perhaps one of the most important ways to modulate that, um, you know, kind of regulate that behavior is to make sure that there's transparency and scrutiny of everything that's going on. Um, so we need to see more of that because, yeah, it's absolutely appalling when disproportionate power is being abused in a way to um, unduly uh, impact on the most vulnerable. And to piggyback on what Nick was saying, um, I do think there is an economic aspect to all of this. Obviously, traffickers are motivated by money. It's inherently an economically motivated crime. Uh, they can have mixed motives, but following the money, thinking about how money is moving, um, and how traffickers are using money as a lever of power to control people um, is really important. And to, to the extent you're asking, what's the cost of, um, of, an, of an effective strategy to have an impact on trafficking? I think that's a really interesting research question and one in which uh, the United Way and the ILO have begun a conversation about um, trying to determine what is the cost of, a, of particularly forced labor interventions and making a difference in forced labor. And, I think I'm looking forward to seeing what that research yields. I think there's a couple of different questions. There's, there, there's the question of how much would it cost to actually enforce forced labor laws in terms of improving the, the delivery system of justice to forced labor victims, just in terms of stopping the situation of trafficking. And then a larger question of what does it cost? What is the financial cost to actually caring for and dealing with the trauma of the trafficking situation um, long term for the survivors of forced labor. And I think that's going to be a different number. Um, and I think as we learn those numbers, we might build new and interesting arguments to governments about how they need to invest in and what would be required as an investment for a successful, a successful forced labor program. Um, and so I'm looking forward to reading through that research as they develop it. Thank you, Ambassador. We have, are down to our final question, and this is coming from an anonymous attendee. I think the issue being danced around is who is responsible, the donors or the CSOs? Is it the responsibility of the CSOs to identify alternative methods to measure impact, as Kevin implied, or to figure out how to comply with IRS requirements, as VJ implied? These organizations are experts at doing their own groundwork, and I challenge donors to actually support this work. The non-restricted funds and trusts are some examples. Would anybody like to comment on this? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to just uh, jump in really quickly. Uh, and, and I'm in agreement with um, the, the questioner. I would say that for us, we really view it as it's incumbent upon the on Humanity United, right? Like, I don't think we really look at the donor or the grantee and say, you have to find ways to comply with the IRS requirement. In that particular case, we actually work with the grantee and provide them with the financial resources to actually submit the application um, to get the uh, equivalency determination. So we're, I think that's the piece where we're happy to sort of play our part. Um, I, I think it, a lot of this really falls at the feet of the donor community uh, as opposed to the CSOs. And I think the one other piece that I would just come back to is also something that we're a bit guilty of, which is donors also have to be, have to be open to like open application process, right? Um, we don't, we for a long time did not do that. Um, and so we were very selective in terms of who could apply for grants and that also limits um, you know, limits to us, to some of those donor darlings that, that I talked about earlier. But um, yeah, in, in response to that, I, I would say the primary responsibility, I would say, is, is at least in our sense, like focused a bit more on the donors rather than the, the civil society organizations. And Cheryl, if I could chime in here as well. Um, yeah, I agree with Vijay that it's, you know, from the donor's perspective, we, we want to encourage new organizations with, with good ideas. Um, so it is something that, that 
we do feel is our responsibility to try to find ways to encourage more applicants. Um, and uh, I also want to echo what Dominique was saying, uh, knowing that the process can be difficult to understand. Um, I agree with Dominique that, that please, if you're applying for something and, and you didn't get the award, as Dominique said, you can reach out, you can get more information. Um, also give us feedback. If you're finding something particularly uh, challenging or confusing, we may think it's clear, uh, but if you are looking at it, you're reading what we're putting out there and you're seeing a problem, we wanna make adjustments. So uh, as Vijay was saying, it's on us because we want to partner with, with organizations that um, have ideas and wanna be part of this community. So um, we wanna work with you, so thanks. Well, thank you, Vijay and Kevin. Um, at this point, I want to close the floor and to thank you, our wonderful audience, for your important questions. And I'd love to now turn it over to Bukeni to conclude things. Yeah, thank you so much, um, uh, Cheryl. Thank you so much, all the panelists. Thank you so much, Ambassador Richmond. Um, on, now, on behalf of the, the Freedom from Slavery Forum, our thanks to everyone, really, who joined us today. Um, you know, the discussion was really amazing, very interesting. And I would like just, you know, I had so many takeaways. And but one that really I want to share is that, um, you know, as we have learned, um, you know, the pandemic has really led everybody to be flexible, especially uh, those uh, work, working on in the more in the resources world uh, have also adapted to the pandemic by being flexible. So that flexibility is what I think, you know, was, um, uh, you know, you know, you know, a part of the discussions today. And we have seen many examples, uh, but, but also donors also try to encourage people to, to kind of um, uh, use some of the, the materials that are being used, that, that are being de de developed. So flexibility uh, is one of the takeaways that I really took. Uh, from uh, these discussions today. Um, so, I mean, you know, uh, as the conversation goes on, uh, we, we encourage you to enter any thoughts you may have in the chat thread uh, so that we can include them in the forum written reports. Uh, start slide, please. So I would like to take a moment uh, to really share about the future of the, you know, you know, of, of the uh, Freedom from Slavery for Forum. As we have seen, you know, the pandemic has really made us being a bit more, uh, I mean, to adapt more on the context. Uh, and, you know, um, though we have met online, we were, we would have preferred to meet in person, but I think, you know, uh, you know, you know uh, the four days uh, has been really great and very energetic for the movement. Uh, as, we look, as we look forward, uh, uh, you know, I want to conclude by sharing with you, how do we move from now to next year, hoping that maybe the situation is going to be better, or maybe we may be still in the same situation as now. Um, you know, we're planning to do, uh, you know, to make sure the, the uh, forum can be, it can continue to, to be more impactful and really try to make sure it can really a, a, a expand a little bit more. For that reason, we want to say, we want to think about how the forum can be he, uh, we can organize the regional forums. Uh, those will be co conducted in the region and also in the local, local languages and with regional focuses. We think this will increase uh, you know, a greater participation, but, but also reflect on issues going on in the re re regions specifically. That way we think you know, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the forum will continue to be a platform that all the activists in the anti-slavery movement will continue relying on to network, to learn, and to share. Next slide, please. As we know, uh, you know this uh, forum for 2020 will not be be possible without the contribution, huge contribution from the ad, uh, from the advisory committee. And I would like really to take a moment to thank all the advisory co co committee members who really uh, spend time uh, to work on this forum to make sure it can be successful as we have seen. 
uh, I would like just to present those members of the advisory committee, uh, you know, such as uh, Banuja Sharam from MSNGS India, uh, free the slave of sports, Cheryl Pereira, who's our great moderator to today uh, from White One Child Canada, uh, Daniel Melese from Freedom Fund Ethiopia, Linda Kalash from Tankin Field for AIDS Jordan, uh, Mara Kelly from United Way uh, Worldwide in the US, uh, Natalia Suzuki from Reporter Brazil in Brazil, in Brazil. Uh, Sean McDonald uh, from Verite uh, here in the US, and Zoe. Uh, throw uh, from uh, Right Lab in UK. So, yeah. So uh, that brings us to an end. Uh, the recording will we will be um, uh, the, the recording for this year forum we will be available, and uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, and our written re report as well uh, will also be coming out soon. Um, uh, you know, the forum secretariat here at Free the Slaves. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, and on behalf of the advisory committee, a, a, a again, I'd like to bring the 2020, uh, you know, conference to a close. And thank you all. And I hope to see you next year again. Thank you.